Well, welcome back to our conference on leadership for the end times. In this session, we're going to be looking at understanding your calling, and we're going to begin by looking at 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, as he's beginning this second epistle, wants to encourage the followers of Christ to be diligent in the service of Christ. And he's asking them to do something that, when you look at it in the first instance, can be quite confusing. What is he asking us to do to make our calling and election sure? Now, I can assure you that if you just simply have a a computerized Bible in English and you do a word search on the word calling and election, by the time you finish that exercise, you will be thoroughly confused. Uh, It is not something that's very simple to understand. And so we're going to first deal with this issue of what it is to be called, because this in this session, we're going to be looking at understanding your calling. Now, there are many different words translated called, but we're going to focus on just a few. First of all, we are called to become a believer In Jesus Christ. That's our first calling, and to be faithful to that calling. To the Corinthians, Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So our first calling is unto Jesus Christ. You know, I have people often, as a pastor, come to me and say, you know, I'm trying to determine what my calling is. And and they're thinking of that in the first instance, as a vocation. What should I be doing with my time? Good question, but it's a question that needs to be built upon a foundation of callings. The first calling needs to be that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Without that, and I have seen this, you can actually get people who are operating vocationally in the body of Christ who aren't even believers. They're laboring in the body of Christ And they're fulfilling functions, but they actually are not members of the body of Christ. So your first calling is to be a believer in Jesus Christ. You're next called to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. You remember, as Jesus is calling individuals to himself, Luke records Jesus saying to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross, and follow me. And, of course, there's loads of different places we could look to in terms of the calling of the disciples in the the sense of the 12 or the 70 and so on and so forth. But it is going beyond just being a believer to becoming a disciple. And it's important that we understand that place. When you study the um, uh, gospel as we present it to the world, that many believe that we are to make believers. We are not. We are to go into all the world and make disciples. Disciples is a different relationship than just simply having a, a cognitive acceptance of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. That does not put you in Christ. That just puts you looking at Christ in that type of relationship. We need to be in Christ. 
And we accomplish that by faith through a uh, miraculous work of the Holy Spirit in which we're born into the body of Christ and therefore covered by the righteousness of Christ and seen by the Father as if we are Christ in terms of not our own righteousness, but robed in His righteousness. So we're secondly, we're called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Third, we are then called to be witnesses. Again, it's important that you, that you deliver that which you first received. Um, I, I've, I've been around people who, uh, who try to be a witness for Christ without themselves first understanding what it is they're even supposed to be presenting. Um, in Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we have what is generally referred to as the Great Commission. And that Great Commission is to every single member of the body of Christ. It is not exclusive to those who might give themselves the label of evangelist or to some pastor or teacher. It is universal for all believers. You know, one of the questions I ask people when we get in the issue of calling is, in essence, what do you think you are called to? To be a trophy of God or a tool for God? And I can assure you, none of us are trophies. God did not get a good deal when he purchased us with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We were in the throwaway bin. And we were paid for with the highest price in the universe that could ever be conceived. We can't even fathom the depth and the breadth of that price that was paid for us. And so we should never come away uh, with an idea that God, God got some kind of deal in procuring us and reconciling us unto himself. But as such, we all have the responsibility to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. It should be something that is a natural byproduct of someone who actually knows what they're saved from. Now, given the demographics of this audience, I'm going to be really careful. I recognize I'm going to really get myself in trouble here. Uh, But I know that if my wife goes shopping and she goes someplace and sees something that's a fantastic deal, she doesn't come home and bury it. She, of course, tells all of her friends. She's... But that's not fair. I do too. If I see something that's a fantastic deal, I honestly feel a compulsion to share it with people that I care about. And so as we look at this third calling, you recognize this should not be something that should ever frighten us. This should be something that excites us because if it's not exciting you, then you don't know what's happened. Yeah, well, the God of the whole universe who creates and sustains absolutely everything from the macro to the micro, (sighs) you know, yeah, he saw me before the foundation of the world, called me unto himself, sent his only begotten son to take upon himself my sin, and all I need to do is repent and believe, and he gives me not only everlasting life, but he indwells me with the Holy Spirit and empowers me to be his witness past the cheese. I mean... And yet that's the way some people really act about the gift of salvation. They act as though it's, it's no big deal. And of course, we certainly don't want to push this on anyone. You know, there's those things you don't talk about. Uh, what are they? Politics, religion, and in-laws. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's the most important thing to talk about in the world. What else is better? What else is more meaningful? And so we are called to be his witnesses, and that should never be something that we should be embarrassed about. Oh, I, I don't really want to push this on you, but, you know, I, 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 I have an eternal relationship with God Almighty, and at the moment you're going to hell and going to spend eternity, but I don't want to push myself on you. Wow, what kind of friend are you? Of course you're going to, going to present that which is life-giving to them. So our third calling is that of, of a witness, and it should be a natural thing. I, I, I love to use the example Uh, having been a pastor, you you have these young couples come to you. And of course, the bride comes up. She is the one, inevitably, that will announce the engagement. They they come up to you together, and it's supposed to be the guy. 
You've seen it, right? So the guy's coming up. He's got this goofy grin on his face. And, and the girl wants to enable her future husband to be the leader. And so she's sitting there quietly. And he comes up and he's kind of like, well, you know, uh, you know, we've been seeing each other. And, uh, you know, we just have really been praying. And the whole time, you finally the girl bursts forth and goes, we're engaged. <laughs> See? I mean, try to keep that quiet, right? I mean, she wants to tell everyone, well, we're engaged. We're, we are the bride of Christ. We're waiting for our bridegroom. Why are we not just equally as proud? I've never seen somebody say, well, we're engaged, but we're trying to keep it really quiet because we don't offend any of you that aren't engaged. I mean, that's just not the way it works, is it? So that's our third calling is that, that we are witnesses for Christ. The fourth which is the area we're going to focus on in this study, is we are called to be functioning members of the body of Christ. There are no vestigial members in the body of Christ. That's a term which means that you're there drawing sustenance but provide no benefit. You know, there was a time in, in sort of uh, modern medicine that they thought that there's various facets and organs and aspects of your life which were vestigial. They were there from some previous evolutionary stage. Now, we now know that's not true. Uh, I, growing up in the 1950s, um, <laughs> of course, as soon as I got a sore throat, the tonsils were vestigial. You didn't need them, so you took them out. So thank you very much. I have no defense now that was naturally there because that was what was done in the 1950s uh, to deal with sore throats. Ah, oh, that's just vestigial. You don't need those things. Well, they're desperately important and that uh, shouldn't have been dealt with. So there are no vestigial members of the body of Christ. We are all there for some function. And part of why you are here is to not only discuss this, but we're going to conduct a lab course afterwards for you to, to discover that if you don't know. And if you do know how to discover what your next step needs to be. Because these conferences are good in the sense that they provide information. But if that information doesn't equip you to actually do something with it, we failed. And so we're going to focus on this fact that we understand that for, as Paul tells the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. But by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And so we have this interesting description of this living organism. Now, what part of your body is more important than the other, if I asked you that? There isn't a part that is more important. They all have different functions. They all can preside over each other in service of one another to the benefit. We might think our mind is important, but without the heart providing the mind with its source of oxygen and nutrition, the mind would be dull. So the mind needs the heart, but the heart needs the mind. And so there is a relationship that in one sense is subservient, but it also ministers one to another. And I think part of the problem that we see in the body of Christ today is because we are using a corporate view of the body of Christ rather than a biblical, a structural view of the body of Christ, a Nicolaitan view of the body of Christ, we've moved away from the organic sense of what the body is. Now, the church is really a great expression of diversity within a framework of unity. There is only one body. You know, again, as a pastor, uh, uh, 20 plus years just in England alone, uh, there were all these churches together type movements that were going on. And they would always approach me and say, you know, it's really sad that the body of Christ is so divided. And I'd say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. <laughs> what? No, we're not divided. There's only one body. The body is together. And we know that we're in the body if we're connected to the head. I'm not so sure that everyone that calls themselves a member of the body of Christ is connected to the head, but that's another issue. What we really see is, is, is more of a, a, a sense of, of not knowing how 
to, to understand and work with one another within the body of Christ. That's the real issue here. It's not a matter of us being divided. It's a matter of the fact that we haven't seen the benefit of settling into what we do best and recognize there's other people that do other things best and allow the master of them all, the head, Christ, to guide and direct and let him be the one that decides whether or not it's useful or, or whatever. So it's that sense of diversity within the framework of unity. When we consider this mystical body of Christ, it's, it's amazing. And we could spend a lot of time in this area. But for, for the sake of what we're trying to accomplish here, we're going to look at the sense of how do we... We know that each member has a specific function or calling within the body of Christ. We're told that. 1 Corinthians 12 is the best place to go for that. And I would commend to you a detailed study of this. I hope that all this becomes... Is, is the pre-dish before the main meal. I hope you don't go away from this weekend thinking that you've heard all there is to say about these subjects of the church or leadership or anything. I hope that all we've done is give you the smell from the kitchen and that you, are, you, are, you leave this place with an appetite so voracious to know more because it's through the work of the Holy Spirit that you're actually going to find out what's really behind all this. So I'm trying to just point you in the general areas for you to be responsible to be self-feeders. Well, welcome back to our conference on leadership for the end times. In this session, we're going to be looking at understanding your calling, and we're going to begin by looking at 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained like pressure through these, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are, will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, as he's beginning this second epistle, wants to encourage the followers of Christ to be diligent in the service of Christ. And he's asking them to do something that when you look at it in the first instance can be quite confusing. For yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren... Be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will have faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through